Chapter 13 Perfect Career Brad received a letter of acceptance from Texas A&M University, noted for its tough academics and low state-supported tuition. To celebrate, he took Barbara to their favorite pizza hut. As they ordered a large pepperoni with black olives, Black Dog by Led Zeppelin came through the ceiling speakers, and Barbara started gyrating her petite body in her chair. Her curly black hair bounced on her shoulders, her big blue eyes brightened, and she smirked at him. My folks hate this music, but I love it. My daddy can't understand why I don't prefer Johnny Cash and Merle Haggard. I like country okay, but man, I'm a rocker all the way. Brad loved rock and roll too, and that Brenda turned it up when Deep Purple or The Stones came on the radio in her pickup truck. He got them back on track. Texas A&M is only an hour drive from here, so I can see you on weekends. I'm going to declare a psychology major and finally figure people out. I know exactly where A&M is, honey. And if you don't make it to Huntsville, I'll show up at your door in College Station, and I better not catch you doing something you wish you hadn't. Brad chuckled and gulped from his tall glass of iced tea. He had considered applying to some Ivy League universities, but without a scholarship, the tuition was a killer. I'm lucky that tuition at a university with such a good reputation is only 400 a year. Did I tell you I can qualify for a low-income grant? That will cover it in my books. He reddened at the confession, but thought she should know. No, really? I knew things were rough, but I didn't know your folks were that poor. Poor darling. How are you going to pay for room and board? She had stopped bouncing around and gave him a worried look. The Stones' can't-you-hear-me-knocking vibed into the air one of her favorites, but she ignored it. I can work enough to pay for that if I don't keep giving money to my parents. Barbara was shocked. My daddy always pays for everything. Mama worked for a while, too. They have a college fund all set up for me and my brother when he's ready. You're in a different world, where I am. Sometimes I wish I knew why I was born to such a family. Barbara winced and looked away until the pizza came, steam rising off the melted cheese. And suddenly... He was ravenous. Barbara was hungry, too, and they ate in silence for several minutes. Brad wolfed a large slice as fast as the cheese burning his palate would let him. Then he reminisced about his gymnastics prowess and how he might have gotten a full scholarship if the coach hadn't pushed him to work out on a broken wrist. Or he might have qualified for an academic scholarship if he hadn't been pulled away in the middle of high school to start over in another state. God works in strange ways, said Barbara. If we aren't getting blessed, then we're getting schooled. I wish you came to church with us on Sundays instead of working in that old warehouse every weekend. Maybe you would get a blessing, darling. They talked about graduation day and summer jobs. The time came for Brad to move to College Station, where he shared a one-bedroom apartment with another student and made straight A's his freshman year. His undergraduate advisor in the psychology department suggested he apply to medical school and become a doctor. Brad liked the idea and figured out that in doing so, he would become a psychiatrist. He would have every tool in the box to fix the most traumatized minds on the planet, starting with his family. During the summer break before his sophomore year, he drove to California to visit his mother and brothers. He hadn't seen them in three years. Natalie was overjoyed on the phone and assured him it would be a nice visit. Mo was still with his girlfriend somewhere in Texas. There would be no trouble. He took off from College Station and drove straight to L.A., except to stop for a long nap after midnight at a rest area along Interstate 10 in New Mexico. Caffeine had become his best friend. He popped pills of the stuff for college finals and had a bottle of it in the glove box for driving as needed. Using a fold-out map of the greater Los Angeles area, he found the address Natalie had given him and finally pulled into the front of a row of old cottages in South Pasadena. It was a terrible neighborhood. Trash was strewn about and beater cars were parked along the street. His mother answered the door and was happy to see him. Robbie was seven years old already and approached Brad as if he were a stranger. Then, after a minute, he ran up and gave him a big hug. Sam was 11, skinny and polite, and calmly gave him a, Hey, big brother. Glenn was out, probably getting into trouble. Jeffrey was working at Taco Bell. It soon became obvious that their mom had no control over her kids. Other than Jeffrey, who kept to himself and made good grades, they were always getting into trouble. Then she started crying. I didn't want to tell you this. They took Glenn away and put him in a foster home. He was skipping school with some punks and got caught stealing jewelry at the mall. 
The police and a social worker were here. They almost took Robbie, too. I'm sorry, Mom. I wish that hadn't happened. Poor Glenn. At least it wasn't for stealing comic books, he thought. Maybe he's better off now. I didn't have time to get you a gift. I'm always working. I hope this helps. He handed her a plain envelope with $200. It was a week's wages from working two jobs in the summer of 77. Her eyes lit up when she looked at the stack of 20s. She was probably thinking of throwing a party later. Oh, you didn't have to do that. I know you're paying your way through school. We got Section 8 now, so we can't get evicted. My welfare check was increased, and Jeffrey has been helping too, and we get food stamps. Ugh. The thought of his family depending on government assistance churned in his stomach. He thought of Mo back in their trailer, living it up with his girlfriend. I'd better hurry up and graduate from medical school and start making some money. Then he shared his career plan with her and waited for her reply. You don't really mean that? You don't really want to be a doctor? With one eye closed, Natalie blew a cloud of smoke at him. She knew he hated that. Then she laughed about it. Brad ignored the bitter stench of the cheap cigarettes that had assaulted his lungs since he was a baby. I do want that, Mom. I made straight A's my first year of college, and my undergraduate advisor suggested it. She got me thinking, what better way is there to help people and be successful? I can finally help our family. I'm going to be a psychiatrist. She blew a smoke ring and he coughed. The same dry cough he had since his childhood exposure to her and most heavy smoking habits. He went and sat on the couch where the air was better. Why don't you learn welding like your father and his father? She said, shifting from side to side as if she had been drinking, which she hadn't. More than likely, he had put her into one of her crappy moods and was spoiling for a fight. Are we talking about the father who is an alcoholic and a gambler? The criminal who can't hold a job for more than two months? I should be just like him? He regretted the cruel comment, but knew she would shake it off. I guess I should be congratulating you on your smart choice. I don't know. I don't know what to say, honey. I'm sorry. She took a step back. This time she blew smoke over her shoulder. In some weird way, Brad thought she might be jealous. He had been on his own since he was 16 when he left the family chaos and his struggling younger siblings. Natalie's experience was different. Tied down as a teenager with baby after baby, unable to pursue a glamorous Hollywood career, and to top it off, a loser for a husband. Still, did that give her the right to cut him down, to assign him to becoming a laborer? It made him think of Superman, how baby Kal-El came to Earth in a space capsule gaining powers from Earth's environment, with a mission to help the planet's people. Brad had done everything he could to be like Superman, yet it had all failed. But he could make straight A's and work hard for as many hours as he could stay awake. He could become a doctor and help people. That's what doctors did, and success would be guaranteed. It was a perfect career, the opposite of the kind of authority figure he hated, of everything his derelict father represented. Dr. Brad Rosedale would be the man, and he would like it. You're welcome to stay here tonight, said Natalie. I've got an extra pillow and a blanket for the floor, or you can share Glenn's bed with Robbie. Her place wasn't much bigger than the small apartment he shared in College Station. There were two tiny bedrooms for the boys, and Natalie slept on the couch. Hell no. It would be more comfortable sleeping in his car. A cat wandered through looking for food, and Natalie talked to it sweetly. Then Sam came in and beamed at Brad. You're going to be a doctor? That's cool. You have to do good in school, huh? Yeah. Have you figured out what you want to be, Sam? When I was your age, I wanted to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a police officer or a soldier. Sam pretended to hold a rifle up and aim it at Brad's chest. With a sly grin on his face, he said, bang. You want to shoot people? Brad asked, worried by how much he looked like their father at that moment. Only the bad guys, said Sam, and went to look inside the refrigerator. Brad turned and could see there was hardly anything in it. Sam was a good-looking kid with high cheekbones and sandy hair, but he was skinny, probably undernourished. He reminded Brad of himself at that age. Natalie and her oldest son sat awkwardly for several minutes. Brad figured he had done as much as he could. I wish things could have gone better for you, Bradley, and for your brothers. You don't need to say that, Mom. It annoyed him that she still called him by his kid name. He'd changed so much since then. 
but she hadn't seen that growth. He stepped outside and closed the door softly and took a deep breath. In a way, he wished he hadn't come back at all. Brad got into the old Buick his menial wages had afforded, with its leaky windshield and retreaded tires. He started the car and looked to see Sam standing in the doorway. The two of them waved goodbye to each other. Brad forced himself to smile for his little brother, the one who'd unknowingly been an accomplice to murder. He made it back to College Station, Texas, sleeping at rest stops along the way, to resume working jobs he hated, slaving away during weekends and summers. A framing carpenter's helper, carrying tools and heavy scaffolds between tracked home construction sites. An order picker in a giant warehouse, working 12 hours on Saturdays and Sundays. Anything that paid more than the fast food restaurants. He worked to pay for a brighter future. Brad ground forward with his menial jobs and caffeine-driven university studies. When he reached his junior year, he submitted applications for medical school and received invitations for interviews. The first at Baylor University in Houston was conducted by a frizzy-haired psychiatrist with a straggly beard. Brad had never met a psychiatrist. He was the man, straight out of Moe's playbook, digging into childhood and family issues, quizzing him about authority figures. It was a humiliating confrontation that Bash's plan to become a psychiatrist and open the way to consider other specialties. Brad was not surprised when a carbon copy rejection letter came within two weeks. The interview at the University of Texas was quite the opposite. A faculty member asked him what the world's greatest problem was. When Brad said, overpopulation, they fell into an inspiring chat. Enthused about Brad's humble family roots, the man, a professor of reproductive biology, told him he could make a good doctor. Brad's acceptance letter arrived, and at the appropriate time, he moved to Houston, where he was paired up with a hawk-nosed roommate named Jared Wacker, who studied like a hound on a fox hunt. Jared spent every waking hour cross-legged in his golden velvet armchair, dominating the small living room in their one-bedroom apartment. Always in a t-shirt and underwear, he kept his long nose down, eyes burning through syllabi and text. By the end of the freshman year, Jared was not only top of the class, but on track to graduate with more honors than anyone in the history of the medical school. While Jared ruthlessly memorized reams of scientific knowledge, Brad went to the gym regularly lived on canned food from a discount grocer and tried to keep his old Buick special from breaking down. In between all those activities, he studied here and there the massive assignments forcing him to pull caffeine-boosted all-nighters before every exam. For the first time since the age of 10, he wasn't driven to hold a job. Financial institutions competed with each other to loan money to future doctors. Without a job to go to, and without Barbara, who he hadn't seen in months since she became busy with law school in Dallas, he also had time for dates, which were easy to get. The public lounge near the med school classrooms was decked out with leather furniture and big planters with tropical ferns. It also regularly featured pretty girls, student dietitians, nursing students, and other ladies who had heard about the place where they could meet young doctors in training. They would hang out and talk, drink sodas, or study. The joke going around was that they were looking for their MRS degree. TGIF parties were held with the good intention of socializing and building relationships among the medical professionals and trainees. But many of the students and residents used the parties to release stress, hook up, and get sloppy drunk. Raging with hormones, the students and residents would pair up and slink off to an upstairs office or go home to bed together. Fights happened, marriages broke up, and all manner of relationship disasters fed the constant gossip going around in Brad's medical school class. When two drunk medical students were caught having sex in an elevator, the TGIFs ended abruptly. By that time, Brad was dating two girls, a sophomore med student he had met at a TGIF party, and an extroverted soon-to-be dietitian who'd seduced him in the leather lounge. Brad's impulsive nature, complicated by growing up around antisocial parents, followed him into medical school. At least he wasn't predisposed to having sex in an elevator. Both of those students were swiftly expelled. During the second half of their freshman year, Jared received a letter from the dean commending him for making the highest number of honors in their class. He taped it on the refrigerator where Brad had to look at it every time he went for his leftover food or a cold drink. Brad's letter from the dean was not taped up. It warned that if he didn't improve his grades, he would have to repeat the entire first year. It made him burn. He'd torn it to pieces until it was a pile of confetti and was flushed down the toilet. Idiot. You're going to fix that, punk. The dean's letter was not a casual threat, 
Several members of his class were repeaters from the previous freshman year. Brad, who had been working out regularly, taking guitar lessons, and devoting himself to finding a girlfriend with soulmate potential, now had a dire need to reprioritize. Looking to Jared for motivation, Brad made his best effort to hit the books. He stirred and fidgeted, ramped up his focus, and engaged his drive to succeed. What you studying for all of a sudden, Jared said. Get a bad letter from the dean? Brad clenched his fists at his roommate's mocking tone. Jared couldn't have known. He routinely mocked the repeaters by name, referring to them as morons. Brad's hawk-nosed roommate had the kind of haughty attitude that only made him study harder. He ended up spending hours in the Health Science Center's library, to the point where his back got stiff and he couldn't stand it anymore. Just like the third grade when Mrs. Finchbow helped him make A's, Brad's grades came up enough to pass the first year. The last exam in his anatomy course covered the female pelvis. He liked the hands-on aspect of anatomy and spent hours meticulously studying and dissecting his cadaver, sometimes alone in the basement, with the cadavers in cold steel tanks and shadows dancing on the walls. He'd often play music from a little portable radio. Late one night, he had an epiphany. He realized he knew every part, every structure inside the entire pelvis. There were a lot of parts, organs, nerves, arteries, bones, muscles, ligaments. There were hundreds. The exam came and Brad made 98%, the highest score in his class, beating Jared by several points. He taped his score sheet on the refrigerator next to Jared's letter from the dean. There was a single word penned at the bottom of the page in Jared's handwriting. So... The head nurse at the clinic found Brad in the doctor's conference room reading a chart, getting ready to present a case to the attending physician. Mr. Rosedale, we need your help. Would you come with me? Brad followed her purposeful stride down a long corridor of exam rooms, marching briskly to where a junior resident stood in front of a closed door. The three of them faced one another. Put these on, said the junior resident, handing Brad two face masks. And these two? She added, giving him a pair of rubber gloves. As well as this. She handed him a face shield, the kind they use when the splattering of bodily fluids was expected. He obediently put them on. Now, go in there and get me a nice swab of her cervix. Use this. She handed him a long plastic tube that had a cotton-tipped applicator in it. If you can do this, you'll be my hero, said the junior resident. And you will get an honors grade from me. Brad was suited up, eager to please, and ready to go in but had been so rushed he hadn't looked at her chart. What's wrong with her? That's what we're trying to figure out. At the very least, she has an out-of-control yeast infection. Opening the door, the resident stepped away, back into the hall, and the nurse had already done so. It was a hot July day, and the windows faced the southern sun. The air conditioner was no match for the stifling heat in the room. That was the first thing that hit him. When he stepped inside, the resident closed the door behind him so quickly it almost hit him in the butt. He took a breath. Oh. My. God. Even with his airway protected by two masks and a face shield, the stench was unbearable. It registered as dangerous, as in a safety threat, the kind of threat that could kill you. Sweat beaded on his forehead as he began breathing very shallowly, little puffs in the mask, then a little with his mouth to relieve the smell in his nose. When the air hit his oral cavity, he could taste it. It was a fetid sensation on the roof of his mouth, putrid, decaying. Ugh. Doctor, are you the doctor now? She had a little voice like a bird trying to be sweet. He could see that the lady on the table weighed at least 300 pounds. Her thighs were as big around as a man's waist. Her legs propped up in stirrups and spread open as is customary for a full gynecological exam. I need to get a sample from your cervix, ma'am, he said. A strange sense of empathy came over him, and the toxic fume seemed to diminish a bit. Poor thing. I'm Dr. Rosedale, the medical student. I'm Mrs. Flowers. Now hurry, baby. I'm tired of lying here like this, and my hips are starting to hurt. He imagined the junior resident nurse helping this patient onto the table, instructing her to put her legs up in the stirrups and getting hit full face by the release of the stench which came when the folds of fat were opened, and without masks on. Okay, hang on, here I come. He would swoop in, jab the cervix, and be out in 10 seconds. 
Brad lunged forward, his face moving between her raised knees. A stronger wave of stench hit him, along with the sight of her infected and necrotic labial tissues. They were issuing fecal-colored drainage that puddled on a wad of paper drapes somebody had shoved under her buttocks. The puddle came into clear view. Was that feces floating in it? Brad held his breath again, swallowing back a gag, trying to inhale through his mouth. The taste on his palate wasn't as bad as the reek in his nasal cavity. However, he adapted and began regaining his composure. 